everyone. Um, I'm Chris Williams. I'm the coordinator, the team leader for the Capital Region PRISM, a partnership for regional invasive species management. Uh, we're fully funded by the New York State DEC. Uh, we have a suite of deliverables that we provide to the state as a subcontractor. Um, I have an office of four core employees, a terrestrial, aquatic, an educator, an outreach, and myself. We hire about 16 seasonal employees. Uh, we work over 11 counties. Wow. We have about three cooperating <coughs> partner groups that we work with. Uh, Wilton Wildlife is one of them. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the Wilton Wildlife Preserve is just the flowers. I live over behind Moreau State Park, so I ride my bike down here when they're in bloom, and I crash my bike in the <laughs> parking lot there, and I take a look for about an hour, and then I get back on my bike and go home. <laughs> um, I have a short amount of time tonight, but I can tell you a lot of stories and work that we've done here in Walton um, in the surrounding area. I'll, I'll start with a real quick note. We work with the Albany Pine Bush, we work with Wilton here, and we work with the Office of Parks and Recreation. Uh, Rose State Park is one of our invasive species prevention zones. And we help to map out invasives on the 880 acre parcel that will be the Big Bend Preserve, which will be converted into a loop and um, a third parcel federally regulated. So we've been, we work with those players in doing stuff there. So I'm really excited about that. That's a really, ecological connectivity is great. And I know the loop grows wild on the roadsides in my neighborhood and there are butterflies that do float around. They're not documented, but I know you've all probably seen them outside of this region. So it'll be a really nice piece. Um, it's been a little bit since I've done this. I'm going to do an introductory approach tonight. You know, we, we have a vision and a mission for our region out of our 11 counties. We're one of eight prisms in the state. We have oh. the APIP prism to the north, which is hosted by the Nature Conservancy. We're hosted by Cornell Cooperative Extension. Uh, the Lower Hudson is New Jersey Trail Alliance, and then there's one in the Catskills, there's one in the Finger Lakes, Western New York. There's one up by the St. Lawrence Seaway. We're all set up similarly. We have similar missions, um, but we're to provide resources uh, to our partner networks. There's a lot of public, private, non-for-profits that we work with to help them manage everything from their forest to their terrestrial to their aquatic realm. Um, so it's a pretty comprehensive program. Uh, I also want to make sure before I finish tonight to, to share with some of the resources and why I brought them. One of the things I forgot was a volunteer sign-up sheet. Um, you're always welcome. Somehow I can get your names if you're interested, but we do work here. Uh, Delgan Pond, we've been clearing out water chestnut. There was an infestation found in 2019. We caught it early. Uh, I think we spent two days in 2019 harvesting over like 3,800 pounds of plants and biomass. Uh, last year when we came out, there was like two garbage bags full that we just got rid of. And then we have uh, some stilt grass that we've been removing, which has almost been eradicated locally from the, the region here. So we do our part. Uh, we just come in and do with our staff and do work, but we can always seek out help for those days or just even training you uh, using IMAP in the future. Uh, there's a mobile app, so when you learn some of these species, you can click them, upload them. We get a report in, the, in our Monday morning uh, from this IMAP and it says, okay, there's a high threat species in this region. We'll prioritize it to see if we want to remove it or not. And not all species are the same. Uh, we, we rank them and I'll talk a little bit about that tonight. You know, so we coordinate partner efforts, we recruit and train citizen scientists or community scientists such as yourself. We deliver education and outreach, but then we're also doing the actual like the science part, the technician part. We, we establish early detection networks. Um, we impl implement control and response efforts using integrated pest management. Um, and we also have a funding source. We award contracts, subcontracts to our partners to do work. Uh, that money comes directly out of the Environmental Protection Fund from New York State. Uh, we usually release around $100,000 a year for about five to 10 projects. Um, so it's kind of kind of like a holistic approach that we do. Yeah. Um, and the key is partners, mm -hmm. training folks like you on invasives. And when you see the really bad ones, you report them. And there's some out there that we are very actively engaged with. We work a lot with the Department of Ag and Markets, 
um, the division of forest and lands and ecosystem health out of the DEC. Those are our two primary state agencies. And then we just have a host of partners that we work with. How many of you have heard what an, no, raise your hand if you know what an invasive species is, right? Yeah, okay. So you've heard the term. Um, one of the things is invasive species are worldwide. They're introduced by goods and services through trade. And then there's intentional releases and unintentional releases. One of our biggest threats are is the horticultural industry through ornamental plant sales. Um, some of these plants, they didn't know at the time, were highly aggressive, highly invasive, um, and very detrimental to our, our environment. And then there's releases where people like will dump a fish tank, and they do not understand that plants like hydrilla uh, spread like wildfire in our aquatic ecosystems and cause millions and millions of dollars in damage. I'll talk a little bit about that today, but we define them as species that cause harm to the environment, humans, our food supply, agricultural su supply, um, and they're a human health hazard in some cases, like hogweed. Um, not all ornamental plants, not all uh, invasive species that are in the United States are what you would call invasive. They're just naturalized, they're here, but they're not causing uh, harm or danger to our environment. So, a couple of things, if I could put a spin on it here, you know, how would invasive species be a threat to, you know, like the current blue butterfly, which is listed as an endangered species, right? So the habitat is really specific. The, the I call it blue pine. Did you think it's blue yeah, though, right? When yeah. I, 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 I hear it both ways, but it goes with a lot. I'm from Western New York and Buffalo, so my <laughs> I have to hide my A's because I you know, sound like I'm from Midwest Canada. <laughs> um, I've been out here for 20 years, I can't get rid of it. Um, but there's a specific relationship there. And if you lose that nice, beautiful flowering plant, you lose the butterfly, right? Um, and in an invasive species, they can come in and take over that habitat. You know, like spotted knapweed, brown knapweed, there's stuff that's floating around. Um, these plants typically did not evolve here on this continent. Right, so, so hundreds of thousands of years overseas in another location, they co-evolved with other plants, insects, and animals that can control that plant, right? There's competition. There's bugs that can eat the plants that have the digestive um, enzymes to break down the tissue. There are other mammals that might eat it and have that digestive uh, capability to break it down. Deer do not eat invasives. They'll sniff them, they might nibble them, but they don't recognize them in their food palate. Um, there's insects that might nibble on an invasive plant, but they don't recognize it and they don't have that capability to break it down. Um, and, and so they're invasive. There's no control. They typically tend to seed earlier than other native plants. They produce more offspring, more seeds, more profiteroles, in much greater numbers. Um, so they tend to do really well before our natives, and they tend to be climate hardy. Um, they're coming from lower latitudes often, um, so they're capable of withstanding those higher temperatures and droughty conditions. And in the face of climate change, um, it's a serious concern. I could go on and on about the definition of invasive species and give you examples. This figure is so old, it's, it's like 10 years old. <laughs> yeah, they did a study. Um, <laughs> Mental and others did a study back in 2005, but like the U.S. spends probably close to $200 billion a year in controlling invasive species. This is the spotted lanternfly. Yeah. This is the instar. It's fourth instar. It's in the capital region now. Um, it's a $400 million agricultural threat uh, to our hops and great apple stone fruit oh. industry. It's That's huge. a heavy hitter for this area. It is a heavy hitter. I brought stuff, I'll share it before we leave, but if you see this, you report it. Yeah. Um, Department of Egg and Markets, our office will be out to confirm it. Trucks at the rest stops when the troopers do the truck, truck, truck checks, 
DECS drones and stuff, they're flying them over the top of the trucks, inside the trucks, and checking for egg masses in the actual kind of hopper. So they're a huge threat. This is Hydrilla, an aquatic threat. It, it grows without light in oh frozen God. waters below the ice. We don't, wow. have, we don't have native plants that do that. Um, so they release energy from their turons, their root system, and they just start to grow regardless of light conditions or not. Oh. Very aggressive. Uh, you know, this is a guy treating uh, an ash tree for the number of the ash borer. You know, that tree is a goner. Um, but there are programs in place to get genetic scions to reproduce in the future. I'll be working with the uh, Department of ESF to start releasing the American chestnut hybrid um, back into our environment. So there's hope when we lose things and we collect a seed source and genetic samples. Oak wilt's another concern. So you've got like forest industry, you have agricultural industry, the aquatic industry, and believe it or not, this is an onion, and that's the alien leaf miner. There's tons of insects that just attack our food supply, and they're just exceptionally aggressive. I have some terminology. I've thought about updating this, but this is good. You know, native species, they're here at the start of time before colon you know, colonial settlers. Okay, they're native. And co-evolving with other species, insects, plants, animals for thousands of years adapting together with their little niches that they live in. Mm -hmm. Non-native species can be exotic, introduced, or alien, right? Ornamental plants that are brought in from overseas, they're not necessarily invasive though. They're not harming the environment or ecosystem they can grow. Okay, there's a lot of examples of that floating around. Um, you know, exotic, you could release an alligator up here, right? Mm -hmm. live for a little bit in the Hudson River, but it's not going to reproduce or make it, no. you know. Um, and then we have nuisance species. People call them weeds. Uh, weeds are not invasive. You just happen to clean, make a fresh slate of bare soil, and it's just ripe for the seeds, and these native beautiful plants come in, and they <laughs> get in your garden, and they make havoc. Um, they're nuisance to us from a social standpoint, but they have an ecological function and they're native. We, you, yeah. got, you call them weeds, they are not invasive. Um, so when we get into defining actual species, um, you know, you have your ornamentals, and these are the ones you're gonna watch out for. Most of uh, the invasive species are coming from plants from the ornamental industry. It's like we didn't know. Like the soil water districts, like 40 years ago, were at least like multi-flora rows and you know, uh, Audemars, they said these are great to plant. They didn't realize they took over the environment. They just, they grew fast, soil stabilization on steep slopes. You know, it was a great idea, but they didn't have the science behind it. Um, and when they escape into the environment, we say they get naturalized. Now they may not be invasive yet, they're just escaping into the environment. When we start to document that all of a sudden they're waking up and they're reproducing in large numbers and pushing out the natives, we say that they're waking up and maybe they're, they're like sleeper species. And with climate change and the warmer weather that's coming, I, I, was, I went for a run before I came here. I was in shorts today. Uh, yeah. It's February 15th. Uh, these things happen, right? Um, so there's this huge potential for these ornamentals that have been floating around that have just been naturalized to start behave differently. Um, we also keep an eye on native plants too. They can change over time and behave differently. But invasives, again, they, they rapidly reproduce and displace native species causing harm. They're the number one reason for extinctions of wildlife. Um, behind who? Humans. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the urban sprawl and development um, is the biggest problem with our environment. Mm -hmm. I just have a really quick question sure. before you move on. Yeah. The lower right-hand corner, which one of those is that? Because I have a lot of it in my backyard. This is uh, the lower Le right. Lesser Salamine, which looks like marshmallow. Yes, gold. I couldn't remember that. Uh, Creeping Charlie. Yes. I hate that plant. Is it a problem? It's a pain in the butt. I mean, it is a pain. It's very cute, though. I love the little purple flowers that look like snapdragons. Like, I love them. It's an herb that was brought over by the colonists. Right. Um, you can throw in a salad. It has a terribly bitter taste, but you know, when you didn't have many preservatives back then. Sure. It spreads what, like wildfire and it you know, spreads pretty well, yeah. Nice sunny lawn like conditions mm -hmm. that we probably shouldn't have anyways. Oh. 
Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Should I be pulling that though? That's it's what I'm wondering. Really, it's really difficult to get rid of. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a proponent of chemicals when oh. you're protecting an endangered species. Okay. And that's another topic. Uh, but you can chemically treat that. Pulling it, if you don't get the little roots, yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll go right back. Oh, that's fine. Thank the, you. The, the thing is prevention. Don't let it get there in the first yeah. place. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, where am I? It's okay. I got lost. Sorry. So this is a general. You know, generalizations get you in trouble. But things you need to know about invasive species, what makes them unique? No known predators or healthy competition. Cover that. Uh, they have advantage over local species. Honeysuckle is the most predominant invasive species in our nation. Released by soil and water districts for stabilization, the birds happen to eat the fruits and it's dispersed by birds. If you're here in April driving down the North Bay 80 miles an hour, I know you do, because everybody else is passing me from the North Bay, <laughs> um, and you start to see green leaves in the understory of the forest along the edge, those leaves are being pushed out on the honeysuckle. Um, that's a competitive advantage. It leaves out almost an entire month early before our native shrubs. Mm -hmm. So it's already started the photosynthetic process. It goes into reproduction sooner and it gains more starches for its root systems. And it does the same on the reverse end of the, in the fall. Um, so that, that's like an advantage it has. They respond better to changes in temperature and harsh environments, drought, uh, flood, too much moisture, they just can handle it. Um, they often have low nutritional value, thus the uh, local animals aren't eating them, not always. Um, greater populations and dispersal, okay? That's a big issue. And they tend to dominate like disturbed areas. So as soon as you plow up the soil, they're like, if you have some type of invasive plant, they're gonna seed it first before the natives because of all these other reasons, and they create these monocultures. Once established, they have a tendency of keeping native plants from returning. They have allopathic properties sometimes where they release chemicals <laughs> to fight other plants. So in these cases where we get like disturbed environments, you get these monocultures, mono one, right? And they tend to take over a region, and this is where you see a reduction in biodiversity. We need biodiversity for more resilient uh, forests and ecosystems to fight climate change. When you have a community, I'll use like urban street trees. If you have your urban street trees are all ash and you have a pestilence like the emerald ash borer come through, it kills all the ash trees, you're left with a naked city and no trees, right? But if you have pine and you have hemlock and you have cedar and you have maple, oak and ash, and you know, honey or um, American, you know, yellow wood, like just tons of different trees, you're not gonna lose the whole entire urban canopy, right? And it goes the same for our actual environment. When you have a lot of different species, they can handle and absorb the energy and change. Um, so the reduction in biodiversity is not good. Um, I, I do not like purple loosestrife. I could talk about that and go into war with our pollinators. Uh, burning bush is another problem. Uh, real quick, honeysuckle, right? It has a nice bloom time, a nice flower. It is nutritional for the honeybee, which is not native to the United States, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of honeybees that are native that are being pushed out by that non-native honeybee issue. Um, but normally in this wetland, there's about 28 to 32 different wetland plants that would grow here. This plant, 100,000 seeds per stalk, capable of taking over. This is like 10 acres, right? So over time, it just repopulated the area, it was more competitive and pushed out the 28 to 30 different um, wetland species. It has a wonderful flower, nutrition, nectar, it's great for the honeybee, um, but it's only flowering for about three to four weeks. All the other native wetland species that would start flowering May, June, July, August, September, October, and November are gone. So there's no longer a food source for those native bees and pollinators that normally would be getting nutrition all through those three seasons. Um, so that's a reduction in biodiversity. The good news, there is a biocontrol that's been released since the 90s that keeps that population well under control. 
some of you might have remembered, you'd drive everywhere and this is all you would see. Yeah. Like the frag bunnies along the throughway now. Um, the populations are, are crashed and there's, uh, there's, there's a root feeding weevil, there's a leaf miner and another beetle that eats it. And they really do a nice job. You can see them <laughs> feeding on it. <laughs> it's a cool creature. Um, I did bring these books with me today. Uh, there's regulated and prohibited species. These are, in these blue and green books, it's the animals and plants that are high threat and very high threat. We, we sign numbers to them. That's not all of them. There is a list of a proposed another 70 that will be added to these in 2023 or 2024 for regulation. Regulation, um, you know, prohibited and regulated. Prohibit means you can't have, sell, transport, trade. It's just bad news. Regulated ones, you can, but you can't release them into a free state. And I have a problem with the regulated ones because uh, the sleeper species that are waking up, burning bush, wing euonymus is one of them. That needs to be moved onto the prohibited list, uh, in my opinion. It's one of the biggest um, invaders of our forest in Saratoga County. It grows early, gets the shade, and it keeps the regeneration of our maples and oaks from occurring. I find it in, in like 10, 15 acres in the middle of the wood underneath the canopy. So it's, it's pretty aggressive. But there are regulated species, they are prohibited, but they're high threat and very high threat, and I'll touch on that shortly. So how do we identify, and this is my talk, I'll be wrapping it up soon, how did the state botanists that were hired, you know, figure out these are high threat, very high threat, moderate, or low threat species? They use a system, and this is just boiled down and real simple, okay? They take and they'll actually get information from like people like us, people like Lily are seeing a plant, we report them that are behaving unusually. So they'll list them. And then they become, okay, how much of a problem is this? So we're getting a lot of reports on this. And once they're listed uh, over time, they may elevate them to be studied to see if they're actually behaving invasively, okay? So literally these botanists over time, there's two rounds of this has been done in the last 10 years. Um, they will go out and they'll study these insects, these plants, and they'll monitor their behavior. And they'll look at four different categories, okay? And each one of them, I have the sheets are like eight or nine pages long, and there's all these observations you make and check and record. Um, but ecological impact, like when we have that loose strife, strife, the purple loose strife was capable of pushing out one structural layer of our biota, you know, you would just push out like some of the grasses, or was it taking out all the grasses, the graminoids, our wetland species? Is it taking out the trees and the shrubs too and keeping them from, that would have a bigger ecological impact and like get rated higher, okay? Some other things they look at is biological characteristics and dispersibility. Is it only spread by seed? Is it spread by seed that birds eat? That's much different than a seed falling off on the plant and growing in place versus a bird dispersal. Bird dispersal will get a higher value, for example, okay? Because it gets transported further and farther and faster. Ecological amplitude and distribution. You know, is it in the forest canopy? Is it on the forest floor? Is it widespread? Can it, can it live in different structures? A wetland? Can it live in a grassland? Can it live in a forest setting? And then difficulty to control. Some invasive species are really tough. Japanese knotweed. Yep. Grows 10 feet down. People try to dig it up on how far today. A foot? <laughs> Good job. <laughs> the taproot is 10 feet, 3 meters. It can grow up to 60 feet horizontally. So when you take that little bit, that's it. It's real difficult to control. And little pieces that break off, they're called propagules. They fragment and they grow root hairs and start to grow. I like it when I get stories from people that call up my office. They're like, I've been trying to take care of this Japanese knotweed. I took my lawnmower out and I mowed it. Oh God. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, and can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah, it's all over my yard now. <laughs> yeah. so, so they didn't use the right control or treatment for the plant. And I try to tell people when you're trying to control these plants, they're very prescriptive, okay? It's like if you have a health condition, you're not gonna treat a toothache using chemotherapy no. or vice versa, right? You're not gonna go to the dentist if you have cancer. So when you're trying to treat these plants, you have to look up the best management practices. 
that need have been like most gloomiest analogy. <laughs> you got the point. Go press. <laughs> it works though, right? Um, so here you go, just to break it down. When they rank all these plants like Japanese knotweed, it's usually about like a 99, you know, uh, oh, wow. duration milfoil is like a 90 something. They're a very high threat species. Only about 5% of the invasive species are high threat like that. Those are the ones that we focus on in our office and low, low populations, okay? Um, high threat, you know, it gets a ranking between 70 and 80. That's 12% of the total ones that are ranked. Or it accounts, you know, if you add them up between high threat and very high threat, you get to 17% altogether. The moderate, low, and insignificant ones, they're not even listed. They're just problematic on a small local level, but they could be if their properties change with climate change. Yep. Um, periwinkle, you guys familiar with that? Yeah. What's another name? Myrtle. What else is it called? It has a couple names. Uh, Vinca minor. Okay. It's an invasive plant. It has a moderate ranking. Um, it doesn't seed, so it's not very aggressive. But mm -hmm. in site where it's been planted, I've seen abandoned houses and farms where the, even the infrastructure of the house is gone. There's a foundation or a farm, you know, like from 80 years ago. But you'll see the periwinkle spread over like 15 acres. <laughs> but it takes like 70 years to get that far. So, oh my gosh. so it's moderately, you know, ranked Amazing. and it's not regulated because it's not a huge impact on our ecosystem. But these high threat, very high threat ones that I started with, there's a bunch of them and they are problematic. Questions so far? Yes. What's the protocol when you have like a native species that's turning invasive? I don't know, the guys at the university in Cornell are telling me to start paying attention. <laughs> um, we document them. Um, one of the things you do is sometimes you take vouchers like a sample and you report like what's going on. And, and you, you make, you know, the state botanist, the natural heritage program aware of them. Most of the people that are doing that are natural resource workers. <laughs> Right, um, but there is a system to do that, but there's no formal documentation. A lot of times we'll get a solicitation by the DEC for plants. We track plants, we have a list, and when they solicit them every four or five years, we submit them to the state. And if they get different agencies and they keep seeing the same plants, they'll, they'll sort them and then start an investigation. There's not a lot of people who do this work, okay? Um, good question though. If you guys ever want to know more, about invasive species. Um, the New York State Natural Heritage Program with the PRISMs have ranked them into a tier system. Uh, tier one, that invasive species not here, okay? And I say it's not here in the capital region 11 counties we work out of, or it may not be in the state at all. Tier two are populations of an invasive species that are found 10 or less. Okay, so if I had an invasive plant here, I have one down in Albany, I had a patch of this invasive plant up in Washington County. If I had 10 of them, it's called tier two. And if they're small patches like the size of this room, we can go out and dig them up and get rid of them, right? That's the game, prevention, is we want to have early detection and mitigate these plants before they spread like wildfire. A tier three species is when there's more than 10 populations, typically between like, you know, 11 and 80. At that point, it's no longer feasible for us to spend money to try and contain the plant, animal, or insect. It's just out of control. Tier four, it's widely established. It's found everywhere. So they rank them by prism. And you can always look up the capital region prism, check it. And then you can put in the tier. And then you can say, I want to know all the aquatic plants or all the aquatic animals, and they'll list them. And that's one way you can learn them. If they're highlighted, there's a link there where you can give you a species profile. You know, for this one, for example, like uh, a more honeysuckle, suckle, uh, very high threat. Um, it says its social economic value is insignificant or negative, which means nobody buys it in the uh, nursery industry anymore. Uh, it's tier four, so it's found everywhere in the state. We have it listed as tier three here because it's not in some of our counties, um, but it's, it's all over the United States. Um, this one here, this algae spurge, Anything spurge is usually problematic, leafy spurge, there's all sorts of them. Um, but you can see it hasn't been assessed yet, but they're aware of its properties, so they list it. 
if there's more evidence comes through this, this will change. Okay. So there is a list that you can look at if you want to know more about them in detail. I try to, I have some stuff here and I'm almost finished. This is the invasion curve I just talked about. So this is time on the bottom. And then we have area invested over, like, say, 11 counties or New York State or the Adirondacks, whatever you want to do. Um, tier 1 are the species that aren't here. We're aware of them, that they're hugely problematic. So we want to prevent them from coming in. We spend very low dollars doing prevention strategies. Awareness, outreach, right? Uh, stop it from getting here. If it's coming on wood pellets from a country or some weird thing, you, you, you stop it. Tier two, this is when there are low populations that 10 or less spread out over our region. We can still spend money. We can have a team of technicians go out in the forest and remove it. It's not widespread. It's still manageable with limited resources, capacity, and economics. Um, tier three is when it's just taking off. You get those, you know, a couple dozen populations, 100 populations. It starts to become unmanageable. Tier four plants are found everywhere. We don't even bother unless it's encroaching on an endangered habitat. We will use a suppression or exclusion technique where you remove it from the area to keep it from seeding and pushing out a rare plant or species. Make sense? Where do you think people in the general public first recognize an invasive species? Maybe tier four. Anybody else? Tier three. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, it is in this boundary right here that people recognize, oh, this is a weird plant. What is this? Mm -hmm. um, we need people identifying and helping us out. Like your caretakers of the wild wildlife. Learn your invasives, the common ones we live with, but start learning some of those rare ones. And we can always do other training programs to, to bring you on board. So to wrap up here, I have no idea how much time I've spent. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm bad about that. Um, so things. I'm going to leave all this here for the preserve. I dump them off every once in a while, but this is like your gateway. Like, you know, the plant one, you know, again, these are the high threat, and very high threat. It's like nice to learn some of them. And again, not all of them are here. That's why I have the New York State tier list. You can look them up. Um, I also provide, this is not the greatest, but the least one at Trust Oasis species. I, it's kind of like a gateway where it's just, we listed like 10 of the common ones that are found around here just for background knowledge for people to learn like oh yeah I've seen this plant you know these are ones that we kind of see all over the place that are widespread tier four but this is the ones that people learn first and the ones that people don't like the most so if you ever get down the road where you like want to treat them we really recommend going to accredited institutions state institutions New York State Invasive Species Research Institute uh, there's a clearinghouse by the state a prism uh, we can get you these best management practices that show you step by step on how to manage the plant depending on what your goals are. Is it manual, mechanical? Do you want to try a chemical treatment? Do you want to use cultural treatments where you plant other plants to help fight that plant? Um, so there's all these guides out there that are called best management practices. So again, that whole prescript, if you're going to try to eradicate this plant locally, know the best way to do it is if you don't, you could actually make it worse and have not weed all over your yard, right? Mm -hmm. And then your neighbor gets mad at you and says they're gonna sue you for doing a bad <laughs> practice, which is a common thing now over in European states. Mm -hmm. If you have Japanese knotweed on your property in England, you cannot sell your home mm -hmm. until you eradicate it and approve that it's been eradicated for three years. Wow. There are a couple New England states that some of the uh, home insurance companies are starting to get on this where they're not going to insure a home if it has Japanese not because it grows through the foundational rock. It's really hard to get rid of. So the thing is, you don't want uh, my neighbor. Okay, just a quick story. <laughs> neighbor, uh, three kids, three dogs. Completely insane when I look out my window, going, "What is going on in this like, you know, zoo across the street?" Guy works like way too many hours doesn't want to mow his lawn anymore. Calls a lawn service, pays for a lawn service to come. They've been mowing his lawn, and guess what? He's now got Japanese knotweed all over his yard. Oh, no, no. I can't prove where that Japanese knotweed came from, but I've learned from experience that those mower decks, if they're not cleaned and you're introducing equipment on your property, 
that's how some of these things are moved around. Quite often when there's construction, parking lots, uh, did a bunch of tree removal here over last year, you know, all those big heavy equipment come in, we really prescribe to the state, the DOT, they use high pressure temperature sprayers and clean the equipment before and after, so they're not introducing these invasives. So that's for a whole nother topic. Those of you that are interested, there's a couple things here. I've got like gardening with climate smart native plants. It's a nice little gateway from the risk assessment network. Here's one that are recommended for not for selling. The state releases these like, you know, plant wise preparing for sleeper species. So I brought three documents for you guys to start educating yourself about native plants, native pollinator gardens, just a little gateway flyers. Last but not least, I'm going to show you two things. Southern pine beetle is found on your property. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Um, <laughs> take this and read it. Um, we're monitoring it. The state is really monitoring it. Um, this creature really knocks out like your scotch pines and then it moves to your pitch pines and other pines like that. Oh. Uh, there is a first documented case that, that's normally it's obligatory host where it hangs out. But in Queensbury, there's a population also found that's attacking the red pines. Um, there's huge quarantines where they're just cutting down like hundreds of acres in like Long Island to treat this. This is problematic. It is found within three miles of here. Um, I don't, I didn't ever follow up with the state what they did, but there's ways to treat it. Like they cut the trees down, you split the bark open, you let the bark fall open, and that you leave it over the winter, and that's enough to let the eggs get killed. Okay but it can reside in low populations. Like you get a handful of these on a tree for five or six years, then they don't know why all of a sudden the population on that tree, just like tens of thousands of them, oh. and they spread. Um, so this is one to take a note on. Uh, there's oak wilt problems in Glenville, New York. So I, I brought a couple things as a gateway for you guys to learn about some of the uh, you know high threat. And of course I got the spot of minor fly because, you know. It's coming, maybe. It, it, it'll, be here. it'll be here. You're going to remember this guy oh. that went to local wildlife and he said he would be here. We're going to eventually have to live with this creature. Uh, we spend a lot of time, like eventually I'll go over to the Dancing Green, the brewery there over. And, uh, I've met the woman a few times, the owner, she's great, but I, I have a whole folder for her. Like, here's what you need to know and you need to budget money for treatments when this creature comes so you don't lose a whole crop and your business goes under. Um, just to be prepared. Cornell Integrated Pest Management has a whole program yeah. of all the different treatments a homeowner can do versus private commercial. Uh, it will be here and it's just going to be a nuisance. On, a, on the other side, we actually have backpack vacuum sprayers where when we locate them with the park, we actually are sucking them up in vacuum cleaners because mm. every female that we get is, you know, 50 eggs less. The problem is when people report this creature, it's already at the point locally where it's in a large population. So it, I think it's fascinating. I've done presentations on the spot of fly for an hour and a half and people are just like enthralled. It's a bug. It's not the worst bug in the world, but it's a bug and it's gonna be problematic. So that was my quick introduction in basic species. Um, the Kappa region prism is here for you folks. Uh, if you ever want to get involved with volunteering, you can email the Capital Region Prism um, at cornell.edu. I'm sorry I didn't include that, I just totally spaced. Uh, but we do have a volunteer sign up or just get involved. Or you could have Lily set up a training program where we could do an IMAP training and a woods walk with identifying some of the invasive species or a follow up. We have Invasive Species Awareness Week in June. We've done that program here a few times if you're interested. Or we just come in the evening like this, this is great just get more people. So I don't know how much time I have, but does anybody have any, I'll entertain two or three questions and then I'm gonna go home and eat because I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so what's your name? Uh, Eleanor. Eleanor, Chris, yes. hi, how thank are you? Thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, so I was just curious, are the, the scripts for taking care of particular plants available online through Prism? Some, okay, it's sure. a lot to manage. Right. <laughs> what I recommend for people to do is you start with the words how to control. Okay, in your search. Spot line or fly. Right. How to control spot the <clears throat> ant weed. Yeah. How to manage, manage and control are your keywords with the species. Okay. 
Now, when stuff comes up, you'll find prisms, you'll find the DEC. So you'll see some of these are DEC flyers, um, but you'll get Cornell and Integrated Pest Management, which is a whole entity. Yeah. They have fact sheets. You might get Penn State. Yeah. Um, so use accredited academic institutions or the U.S. Um, NRCS, which is the you know part of the Forest Service for Natural Resources. Go to those accredited institutions. Do not go to somebody's blog that says, well, I took some whipped cream, some vinegar, <laughs> I did a dance, and it, I got rid of it. Oh, okay. And, you know, uh, there are a lot of, like, those, uh, you know, I don't even know what you call them, but, like, which it's is... Almost, yeah, they're, they're, first, they're not scientifically proven, and they sometimes cause harms, and they spread a lot of information that's incorrect and do other people harm. Certainly. Good question. Anybody else? Yes. What's your name? Sam. Sam. Chris. Nice to meet you. Trying to make this life personal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I guess when you're talking about these different characteristics, is this usually happening at the species level, or is there examples where you might have particular strains of something that are problematic? Oh, geez, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so, I guess on the other side of that, could you like, there's cultivars, right? Cultivars, you know manipulated plants. Some cultivars are more aggressive than others, but then there's by the genus where all, no matter what, are, are pain. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like to tell people, look at them specifically. Um, sometimes people are like, well, I, I went to this store and I bought this plant and they said it was sterile and it won't produce seeds. It, it's, a, it's not true. <laughs> so they did a study of um, oh, what is that plant? I really need it. Um, oh, geez, I'll come to you in a minute. Japanese barberry. There it is. See, it's late. I need food. <laughs> Japanese barberry, right? It's got these little thorns on it, grows quickly. Every box retail store at one point was putting them along the curves of their, like, parking lots, right? First, it harbors the white-footed deer mouse who carries tick. And then the ticks like it because it's got this little microclimate and the ticks survive. So people that have Japanese barber in their property have higher rates of Lyme disease. Oh, wow. So it's a human health effect. Yeah, as, soon as, as soon as I tell people that, that's how I convince them to dig it out because they like the colors on the plant. Um, second, they did a study, 48 different cultivars, right? And there was this program where they produced something like 37 of them and they said that they were sterile. It wouldn't produce seeds. So there was a study done where they took these 38 plants and they actually monitored them over a five to seven year period. Guess how many turned out to be truly sterile and didn't revert to their normal properties? Zero. Yeah. <laughs> Three. Wow. Three. Right? So when you have people telling you, like, you know, that, that just goes to show all the cultivars ended up in this one study for one plant, which is indicative of other plants. That you know you can't control mother nature, no matter what you think you're doing. The human hand is heavy, and it creates massive problems, as we see, right? So you come to the world of wildlife, and you hike the trails, and you look at the butterflies. And <laughs> good place to be. Other questions to wrap up? Um, yes. Yeah, I'm Julie. Hi, Julie. Uh, what does a success story look like? You mentioned in the beginning, okay. like the American chestnut, and a lot of this work seems like it's a losing battle almost, just not oh, ready. Yeah. So it's like doom and gloom. Right? <laughs> what do we do? Yeah. Take, just take a take a hole and just put your head in there and just let it happen. <laughs> no. Work? Yeah. One of the things. So, you know, what was the number? Like five percent or high threat species, mm -hmm. right? It seems like doom and gloom. Five percent, right? Um, there's hundreds of other plants out there. So the education, prevention, going native, protecting, the whole new thing is conservation management. It's not about, oh, okay, I'm gonna get an easement and lock this up in forever wild and never touch it. That is a disaster waiting to happen. The action of not doing anything is bad. So we can protect and preserve where there are not invasives. And there's a lot of properties that are like that, okay? So that's one thing, that's a message. Uh, two, some of these invasives are gonna be here to stay. It's a, global reconfiguration of population of plants on a very rapid scale. But there's ways that we can slow it down. Biocontrols are an answer. So success story, purple loose strife. I mean, 
very easily could just take over all of this. It won't, won't happen. I know it grows right around here. I'd probably say less than a percent of the time I'm looking, I'll see purple loosestrife growing around, especially by the, the creek over there in Delegate Pond. Um, that beetle went through 20 years of study, and then it was deemed that it would not harm other native plants, so it was released, and it keeps those populations repressed. Hemlock trees are under attack by the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid is in this community. Um, we work with the Cornell Bug Lab in New York State Invasive Species Research Institute. We prioritize hemlock stands uh, for treatments, chemical, which is actually really cool because hemlocks don't pollinate. So we just inject the trees and it goes in there and then the, takes care of the insect and it breaks down and doesn't harm all the parts of the environment. It's really cool. Ooh. But a better solution, a much cheaper solution, is there's four predators, biocontrol releases, two silverflies from the Pacific Northwest where the hemlock oil delgit lives in those hemlocks and there's predators. And then there's Larry Cooper Snyder's little black beetle from Japan. Um, and I forget the other predator, but uh, we have two of the predators are working. Um, it takes time though to do the assessments to see if it really work and what's the longevity. Um, the hemlock woolly adult is complicated because it the it's only female asexually reproducing and it produces two offspring a year and the predators only get the one egg batch. So we're trying to get the third predator to get the other eggs that are laid at a different time of the year. Um, so the hope is that we can get that third predator rolling and then releasing them in our communities to stop that invasive. We need time though, we have to buy time to slow the spread down so we can let the research happen. Um, so there are a lot of success stories in that, that department. The number one thing is prevention. You know, tr treat your environment like pristine. You know, cleaning your boots, cleaning your bikes, dogs, uh, not bringing equipment in, moving soil around. Uh, you know, bare root plant sales and tree sales, bare root stock is where it's at. Uh, it's, it's humans that are moving these plants around. We're the problem. So it really is us. And, it, and that's what it comes down to. Change your buying processes with these ornamental plants. Ask for natives in your nursery. You, you're starting to see more and more of them, right? Reader's Digest had no on in their Reader's Digest, which I don't read Reader's Digest, but someone like sent it to my office, like, look at what Reader's Digest is. <laughs> they have like an article on no, no lawns. Uh, lawns are very problematic. Uh, it drives me nuts to see all the fertilizers, pesticides, which kill most of our pollinators. Um, you plant the ornamental flowers, which the pollinators don't use, and then the bird populations are crashing. It's just a whole system. It's all human induced. So go native, be responsible human beings, take care of your parcels, your property, know what you're doing. You know? On the contractors outside, we were always telling the contractors and writing language for them, like in your uh, agreements, when you have contractors come, that they have to clean their equipment before and after they leave a parcel to prevent, 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 prevent. How hard is it to have a high pressure temperature sprayer to clean some of this equipment? Thank you. Uh, that's it for me tonight. Mm -hmm. If you have a phone, and I'm sorry, I didn't have the most updated information. I tell people, take a screenshot. <laughs> and you can at least track us down or email our front page of our website. Um, sometimes I can get to emails. Sometimes I can't. It's, it's a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. With so, your five employees <laughs> and all of our seasonal employees. We have a huge impact. We, we, yeah. we last year, in the last five years, we had 300 educational trainings and reached 3,000 people. Great. Our indirects are close to about 80 to 90,000 through our website and other avenues. But our greater impacts are working with our partners and the work we do because we have project-based work for restoring the landscape. Yeah, so do your part.